Welcome back to Morning Joy, where truth matters. I'm Keith Downey, your host, and we're talking all about the power of names, the powerful name of Jesus, and so much more on The Next Right Thing with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. Good morning, Debbie and Adam. Good morning, Keith. Thanks so much. Um, the Next Right Thing is so important important for us on Morning Joy because it gives us the, the next steps, Adam, for us to start um, spiritually um, maturing and, and growing in our faith. And that's a good thing. And so we're opening up the phone lines at 877-757-9424. If there's something that you hear us say about the power of the name of Jesus, and you want to share your story, your experience, please call in 877-757-9424. But Adam, well, I received when I was when I was much younger a little blue book from from Tan Books by Father Paul O'Sullivan, and it's it's the pow, it, the Holy Name of Jesus, and it is so powerful. This little book, it's like sixty four pages. Um, it's you can still get it. Folks can still get it. It only costs like five dollars. It w- it changed the way I felt about saying and praying the name of Jesus. So uh, that's why the next right thing is is I think so. Um, key to the morning joy experience because maybe somebody listening right now they never thought of that that Jesus uh, the name of Jesus is a prayer and so this might change the way they look at things and they can they can grow in their faith so why don't you why don't you start and I definitely want to go to the catechism as well yes so it's interesting one of the places we're going to go to today is is Philippians 2 9 to 11 um in a, in a moment here, and that's that's a scripture that we quote uh, to the enemy at exorcisms on a fairly regular basis, and, and we did just last week. Names are so powerful. So first, it's good to understand in general, in the Bible and in the whole ancient world, names were really important. So when you like told somebody something in the name of the king, it carried the authority, as long as you were properly delegated by that king to either deliver a message or um, a command to somebody that was that was under that king, giving something in the name of the king was the same as the king telling you that. And so when you invoke the name of an authority, whether it's civil or spiritual, you are appealing to their authority and power in what you're saying, and you're expecting the hearer or the, the multiple hearers to treat it as if the king is delivering that message. And we see that play out both in the ancient world, we see that play out in, in the New Testament, we see that play out in the life of the church, that names are really important. Some of the clues about that, you know, the, the name of God in the Old Testament, so of course Jesus hadn't come yet, they didn't know you know, there was references in prophecy about the name, you know, he will be called Emmanuel, which is God among us. Um, there were some references to what the Messiah would be called, but the name of God, the Father for the ancient Jews was so important that nobody knew it until Moses. He was given the honor of being the first one to know the name of God. So what they would write usually was the Lord. This wasn't the name of God, this was the title. You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, sometimes that can be translated like king of the universe, king of all. It's the Lord over everything because he is the creator. Now, in addition to using just the title the Lord, we will also see uh, the name of God appearing in the Old Testament with just the consonants of the word, with the vowels being removed. And so we don't know exactly how it would have been pronounced. So even when the name of God is recorded, um, the the vowels are removed, and so you end up not writing it down exactly. And part of the idea there is that only the, the high priest, I believe in most instances, would have the honor of actually knowing the name of God. Now, passing things on, saying things in the name of an authority was part of it, but also there's an idea in scripture that to give your name over to somebody is to hand over authority to them to some extent. You still have authority over yourself, but when you were to give your true name to somebody, it's a form of submission and they then can call you 
uh, in a more powerful way. And we can see this just in our lives today. If somebody knows your name and you're you're at a gathering, you know, a, a, a big event and there's 50, 100 people in the room milling around and chatting, if somebody says your name, you typically perk up and turn and figure out, oh, who, who said my name? And it's, and it's just an instinct. It's, it's hardwired into us that if somebody says our name, uh, we react. So that's part of it too. Names are so, so important. So when people, when, you know, when Jesus came, there's a couple things about names that became really important. He came as one of us. He took a common name, the name Jesus, in terms of just that for, just that name was a common name. So we could think of, you know, somebody having perhaps the name of John or um, a very common name. He came down, became one of us, took one of our names that is a common name and shares it with us, doesn't hide that name from us, wants us to know his name. Not that he's giving us authority over him, but he wants us to be his friend and to be able to use his name and share his name with others. So clearly he is part of the Trinity. He is the creator. We don't have authority over Jesus, but we have the ability to call his name. And, you know, figuratively, he perks up and he listens. When we make a prayer and we say, you know, Jesus, please help me, that in a sense, is a directed prayer that, of course, he hears all prayer. But when we say it in his name, we are appealing to that friendship. You have given me your name. I have the right and the privilege to call you by name. And therefore, that prayer, I have, in a sense, a greater confidence in that prayer because we are friends and we have shared our names with each other. Does that make sense so far? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, D totally. Um, and I think that, that that is, you know, very, very uh, powerful. That's what we titled the um, the whole entire show today of, you know, the power in a name. And I think that's, that's why for many of us as Christians, when we hear his name taken in vain, it really disturbs us because mm -hmm. the use, the way it's used so casually in movies and and uh, things like that and that's why it's <clears throat> excuse me and that's why it's very dangerous because it is it, it is so incredible of a name and it is a prayer and like you said adam you you use that um philippians 2 9 through 11 at exorcisms maybe just go over that again what that um scripture verse uh the verses say and and tell us like what the um, the the demon how the demon responds because maybe that can help us understand the power of the name of Jesus. Yeah, and and I'm going to read that in just a second. I just want to point out that when we say Jesus, it is it is a a, a sign of friendship and a calling out to him by name. When we say Christ, that word means christened, and that is a pointing to or it's kind of an honorary title that says kingship because the king would be christened with oil at their coronation and so somebody who's christened is the king so when we say jesus christ we are really saying jesus the king in a sense um, and so that's why it's very interesting in philippians 2 9 through 11 you're going to see that just the name of Jesus is given, but also the name Jesus Christ is given. So I wanted to explain the difference there. So let's, let's read this wonderful scripture. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's a few things there right at the end, right? We see the Christ being added, so acknowledging kingship, and then is Lord, which is a call back to the Old Testament when the name the Lord instead of the proper name of God was given. So here we see a linking of Jesus Christ to the Lord that the Jews understood as the creator of the universe in the Old Testament. That's really important. And then to the glory of God the Father. So this is 
kind of showing us the Trinitarian theology and idea being developed right there in the New Testament, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Old Testament to the glory of God the Father. Really beautiful. Um, now, that scripture, sometimes during exorcisms, God, at his own choice, we don't do it sometimes, will compel the demons to kneel, usually drop to one knee, or prostrate entirely facing the tabernacle in the church. Um, I've seen this fairly often when there's a new priest in training that's there and has maybe been a little shaken by some of the displays of the demon and the arrogance and the, the loudness and all of that. Jesus will humble them in front of the priest as a reminder, don't be scared by this. Don't let this thing rattle you. I am the king. Uh, and sometimes when they're particularly blasphemous or say something insulting, particularly about his mother, they will be silenced and they will prostrate before the tabernacle because all creatures acknowledge that. In addition, what you were referencing that we've talked about sometimes is um, sometimes the exorcist, when a demon is being particularly arrogant, which they're often arrogant, that's nothing new, will remind them that Jesus is God and will read from memory, Philippians 2, 9 through 11, that every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bend. We will all take a knee facing mm. the tabernacle at that moment, the exorcist and everybody else present. And then in shuddering, terrible fear and moaning, pain and distress, the demon will take a knee along with us in silence and acknowledge the name wow. of Jesus. Wow. And that every every knee will bend at that name. Right, right. Wow. Well, we've got more to say about this. Um, when we come back, I'm going to send it back to Keith. He's got some announcements. When we come back, we'll talk more about where uh, in Scripture the power of, of the name of Jesus and also in the catechism of the Catholic Church. And I want to ask Adam another question about the exorcism work that he does where uh, Jesus is, is um, they can feel Jesus present there. I want to ask him about that. So for now, let's send it back to Keith. Thank you so much, Debbie and Adam. And, and it's so always so disappointing when maybe like your favorite podcaster or content creators or even YouTubers use Jesus's name in vain. It's it's really disappointing because they have no idea what they're doing. And that's the whole idea with the next right thing is to help us understand what we're doing, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. It's kind of getting back to the basics here. And that's that's the whole premise of morning joy in itself as well. So we're glad you're here with us. And if you maybe just missed the previous segment, it's OK to search Morning Joy Radio on YouTube. We recommend YouTube. Also Rumble. But coming up next, we're talking more about where in Scripture the power of name of Jesus is and where it's in the Catechism. Talking all about that on The Next Right Thing with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly right here on Morning Joy, where truth matters. You're listening to Morning Joy, where truth matters. This is the Pope Paul VI Institute Minute with Dr. Tom Hilgers. During my OBGYN residency at the Mayo Clinic, I was committed to the pro-life movement and was very involved in it as an author and activist. When I graduated, I made the decision not to prescribe the birth control pill in my medical practice, yet I needed to give my patients a reliable means of family planning. I began to see natural methods of fertility regulation as an extension of the pro-life movement. So in 1976, with a small team of researchers at St. Louis University School of Medicine, I began an independent investigation of the cervical mucus observation and its correlation to fertility. From this, we were able to standardize the mucus observation and thus develop the Creighton Model Fertility Care System. Until next time, I'm Dr. Tom Hilgers. For a complimentary gift and more information on the Pope Paul VI Institute, log on to www.popepaulvi6.com. Do you long to hear God's voice? Lord, teach me to pray. The pre-Ignatian prayer series will open your heart to His voice, to the peace you are seeking, and the only love that fulfills the human heart, Jesus. God is calling you to true joy, knowing Jesus personally. Lord, teach me to pray is free. Go to lordteachmetopray.com, click on the red box, order Lord, teach me to pray now. 
go to lordteachmetopray.com. Welcome back to Morning Joy, where truth matters. I'm your host, Keith Downey, and we're continuing this conversation on the powerful name of Jesus. And we're about to bring up scripture and cat- the catechism right now, right here on The Next Right Thing with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. Take it away, Debbie Adam. Thank you so much, Keith. Yeah, this goes very quickly. I know we have the phone lines open, so you can squeeze in a call if, if something comes to mind about using and praying the name of Jesus. It's very important that we um, are very respectful because how powerful his name is. Uh, The number to dial if you want to get a call in very fast, 877-757-9424. And I just got a message. They wanted to know the name of that little blue book, Adam. It's The Wonders of the Holy Name by Father Paul O'Sullivan. It's uh, Just look for the blue cover. It's a bright blue cover. It's from Tan Books. It's about $5. It's like 64 pages. I love that book. I used to give it out as gifts. But Adam, we wanted to um, go to, uh, let's go um, back to scripture. And then I actually, to make, we're going to, we're going to, we don't have enough time. We actually should do a whole show on this, Adam. It's very important. But I just want to call attention to paragraph two, two, um, it's actually 2666, uh, paragraph 2666 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about the name of Jesus. And it talks about um, when we invoke the name of Jesus, it's welcoming the Son of God who loved him and who gave himself up for him. It is a very powerful uh, uh, paragraph in the Catechism, but there's um, other areas of the Catechism. All you have to do, folks, if you don't have a Catechism at home, just go um, online and just type in CCC, that's Catechism of the Catholic Church, on the name of Jesus. And several paragraphs come up. It, they are just beautiful. And it's a great way to catechize your family on, the, on how to respectfully use the name of Jesus. But Adam, I know you wanted to go back to scripture and also the commandments, but I must ask you before we have our time up today, um, did, now G, Jesus is present during these exorcism um, sessions, or is he sometimes present? Well, I mean, Jesus is present everywhere, of course, but in a particular way, he is present in the tabernacle, and the consecrated host, so in the Eucharist. Um, so what I've seen over the years is when God, again, God does this, it's, and it's not us choosing it, there are cases where God will compel the demon in the, in the possessed person, so, you know, with the body of the possessed person, to go down and prostrate. It is always facing towards the tabernacle um, because Jesus is there in a particular way. Um, yeah, I've, I've even, it's, it's a different story, but you know, the first time I encountered the actual Satan, I've encountered him three times over the years. Um, he didn't do much with us, but basically had a conversation with the tabernacle, was, was started, you know, speaking to and apparently with Jesus. We couldn't hear what Jesus was saying, but because Satan was in a body, we heard what he was saying. And it sounded like something out of the Old Testament, basically. Um, so even when you know satan showed up he was oriented towards the tabernacle and addressed jesus as the authority you know in the room um and then did what jesus said because he's god so yes jesus is always present um we we always try to do exorcisms in a church someplace where the eucharist is present Um, there are certain circumstances where it would be done in somebody's home but that would be an unusual circumstance Wow, it's fascinating. Okay, and you wanted to move to the commandments, and keep in mind that we number the commandments, uh, the Catholics uh, number the commandments a little differently than our Christian brothers and sisters, so that's why I wanted to make sure we we just address the actual commandment. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have the commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And so we, we see the Lord in there, you know, which is kind of a callback, as we said, to the Old Testament, Uh, tradition of writing the Lord instead of the name of God. And this, of course, for us as Christians applies to the name of Jesus. Um, You know, as we said, when we were reading Philippians, and there's other proofs of this, um, but Jesus Christ is Lord, you know, Philippians 2, 11, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when we say, don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, we are clearly saying, don't take the name of Jesus in vain. 
And, you know, what does this mean? This means reference and speaking about God and holy things and keeping of any oaths and vows because when we make promises to God, uh, invoking the name of God, that, that is a very important thing. So that includes not only casually saying the name of Jesus Christ, but um, when we use that name in terms of promises and oaths, and, and it forbids blasphemy, um, speaking disrespectfully of Jesus and his, you know, the holy things that he has given us, and breaking vows that we take in the name of Jesus. So it's much broader than just kind of the casual abuse of his name. Um, and it's important, I think, to reflect on that, because Again, the, the power of a name plays out in a number of ways, not just in speaking reverently. So what would you suggest to people when they are taught at various classes to invoke the name of Jesus, to, you know, push away any demonic attacks and things like that? Is it is it more, instead of using the, the uh, power of the name of Jesus, it, would it be better to just uh, ask Jesus for help? Is it better to approach it that way as opposed to it, trying to command something? Yeah, this is a huge topic, Deb, and it's an area that I almost want to write a book on. I was actually just talking with a very scholarly, um, well-trained priest yesterday, long conversation about this question. Kind of the bottom line is, in my experience, and it's not just my armchair saying, you know, you should do what I say because of citing something. I'm also, yes, that's true, you can cite things to support this, but after years of experience, um, I can say clearly that you need to be, um, you need to be aware of authority and the way the church has structured authority around the demonic by regulating the confrontations with the demonic when they're in this, you know, extraordinary cases of possession. This is not something to be done lightly. And I can tell you from experience, when you directly challenge a demon by giving it a command, um, you want to have a proper authority behind that. Because once, once you challenge somebody, you consent to them pushing back spiritually or right. in, in our case physically because you know we're there at an exorcism so it's not something to be done lightly my personal advice is mm -hmm. ask jesus to do it mm -hmm. in my experience that is no less effective than giving a command in the name of jesus gotcha. god is present um yeah. and i think it's safer to just ask him to do mm -hmm. it okay well, well we're gonna have to do a whole nother show on that too but we've got a caller adam real quickly marie in springfield virginia listening on wmet uh marie thank you for calling and welcome to morning joy uh yes thank you i just want everyone to know that the word jesus means god saved mm -hmm. thank you Okay, Marie, thank you. You're right. It is who he is and it is his mission. God it, so it's it's he's God and he and he uh came to save. Absolutely. And the catechism talks about that as well, Adam, a beautiful portion in the catechism. And that's why the catechism is is <laughs> um necessary uh, for all uh, Catholic Christians to have or go online to really dive deeply. I love the way Marie said that because it's true, Adam, it's his mission and who he is. Mm -hmm. And the name, you know, as we're coming towards the end here, um, the name is powerful. So when you appeal to Jesus, appeal to him by his name, it's good to use Christ because it's an acknowledgement of kingship and our place as being under his kingship. We are creatures. He is the creator. Um, you know, and, and meditating on the name of Jesus is a form of contemplation. We've talked right. about, you know, uh, Eucharistic adoration is a form of contemplation of God. Mm -hmm. Meditating on the name of Jesus is too. Um, you know, there's the Jesus prayer, which is a very short prayer a uh, repetitive mm -hmm. prayer that's usually said mentally that involves the repetition of the name of Jesus. Um, of course, right. you want to be a little cautious with that one. I would say do it under a spiritual director's guidance mm -hmm. um, because some people misunderstand how to use it, yeah. but it's powerful. Yep, absolutely. I wish we had more time, Adam, but we don't. So have a nice day, Adam. Thank you so much. Thank you to Marie who called in, and, and we're going to send it back to Keith for the rest of Morning Joy. All right. Thank you, Debbie and Adam, and of course, Marie, for calling in. That was a great little tidbit you gave us. And yes, if you're looking for more Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly and, and maybe 
having them talk, you know, five days a week isn't enough. Well, you still have Saturdays. You can catch them on the Spirit World, and that's every single Saturday at 10 a.m. Central, where they talk about angels, demons, and everything in between. Coming up next, how many names does God actually have? Grab your thinking cap, because we're going to be talking with Dave Palmer on our Thinking Out Loud segment right here on Morning Joy, where truth matters. We'll see you after this break. You're listening to Morning Joy, where truth matters.